today as we continue our study in Colossians, we ask, is there a war going on in your house? Are there battles occurring in your home? Do some family members have emotional battle scars? Are there some people who are frustrated in your household? As we study the book of Colossians, we've come to the applicable section. And Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, addresses the key relationships we have in families um, and work and so on. We've been the last two Sundays talking about marriage, husbands and wives and their responsibility and how being a mature believer has to affect those relationships and how we relate to one another according to God's um, design. Today we come to children and parenting as we come to Galatians, uh, excuse me, Colossians chapter 3 verses 20 through 21. And in this section, Paul addresses uh, the importance of good relationships between parents and children. And part of this is to children. And so we uh, thought we would um, have the children uh, with us here today. Now, we, God wants our parent-child relationships to honor him and to be a testimony of mature Christian that we ought to be, that he wants us to be. So mature Christian behavior should also affect the parent-child relationships in the home. Follow along as I read Colossians 3, verse 20 and 21. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. And then verse 21. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Children, first of all, this is addressed to you, so listen up. There are, of course, all of Scripture includes you, but this is especially addressed to you. And um, children are told here to obey their parents, mom and dad. For children, obedience involves listening to and following their parents as their earthly authorities. God, of course, is all to all ultimately authority over all of us. But God has known that children needed um, parents to bring them into this world, to protect them, to provide for them, to lead and guide them, to teach them, uh, all of those things, um, to point them in the right direction. Uh, the Old Testament's clear that parents are, of course, to raise up their children in, in godliness and to understand about God and so on. And so... God has placed into the home, the family unit, parents as the authority, the earthly authority uh, that God wants to work through and wants to use. So children, addressed to you, it tells us as children to obey those parents as our earthly authority. Now, boys and girls, God gave you as a gift to your parents. It is, of course, a wonderful, creative way as how mom and dad, together with God, um, brought you to life. So you are a gift to your parents. Um, maybe sometimes they are outwardly uh, communicative of that, and sometimes maybe they're not as much, but you are a gift to them. And they are also a gift to you. God has given you a mom and dad. Now, you know, we live in a world where not everybody has a mom and dad. And so sometimes um, we take them for granted, and we ought not to do that. Um, my family members have had the opportunity, many trips, to go to Russia and minister in orphanages. There are at least 800,000 children in, in Russia in orphanages. They don't have parents or they don't have parents who can care for them, whatever the case might be. Mom and dad have died, mom and dad have left, mom and dad have given them up. Um, they were starving, mom and dad couldn't provide for them. And these boys and girls want more than anything to have a mom and dad. Wow, it's a bit heart-wrenching to have a 12, 13-year-old girl come up to me and say, would you please adopt me? Would you please take me home with they want that. You have that. God has provided you with a mom and dad. 
and you need to see them as a gift from God. And you need to take that by faith. That this is the mom and dad God has given you. And no, they're not perfect, okay? No moms and dads are perfect. No moms and dads parent perfectly. Not a single one of them. And yet we can learn a lot from them. And they do a lot for us. And so we need to appreciate them, children. Secondly, the Bible, of course, commands us then to obey them. There's a certain way God wants us to relate to parents. And we are to follow the example of Jesus. Well, how did Jesus treat his parents? Now, here's Jesus, the Son of God, who is perfect, and his parents are not perfect. And yet, we read in Luke 2, 51, then he, Jesus, went down with them, with his parents, came to Nazareth, Nazareth and he was subject to them. He submitted to them. He obeyed them. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. So Jesus, the Son of God, who probably at least when he came to uh, more and more mental capability knew way more than his parents ever knew, he nonetheless obeyed them. He was subject to them. He was obedient to them. Now you can just think about that for a while. This afternoon, how would it have been like to be one of Jesus' brothers or sister and be compared, you know, Mary saying, why can't you be obedient like Jesus? He's always obedient. What is wrong with you? <laughs> uh, maybe there's a reason they didn't believe in him until after the resurrection. We don't know. But Jesus set an example, and we're to follow him. And he obeyed God's command to obey his parents, even though they were, they were uh, sinners. They were imperfect parents, and he was perfect. Children's disobedience of their parents is sin. We need to understand that if God commands you, boys and girls, to obey mom and dad, then to disobey mom and dad is to disobey God, who told us to obey them and who gave us those parents as authorities. We see in the parallel passage to this one, Ephesians 6, 1, children obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. It is something God wants us to do. You know, all of submission that we're commanded in the Bible is like that. Even two Sundays ago when we talked about wives being submissive to their husbands. It's for the Lord. It's to obey his command. It's between a wife and God. She does it for him. She does it uh, to obey God's command. And children, you need to obey mom and dad because God said so. And, you know, we want to obey him. If we disobey mom and dad, that disobeys God. And so that's sin. Now, how do we deal with that? 1 John 1, 9, we confess it as sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so there are times that we need to say, Mom and Dad, I'm sorry. I disobeyed. I didn't do what you told me. I did do this. You told me not to do it, whatever the case might be. And then, God, I'm sorry that I disobeyed Mom and Dad. Forgive me. And he does, and he cleanses us. And he wants to give you the strength and power to obey. Now, none of us are perfect in that. We live in a sinful world. We have... We're, we're sinners, we're going to blow it, but we need to admit that. That's what confession means. To agree with God, Ma, uh, I blew it. I disobeyed Mom. I didn't listen to Dad. Uh, and that's sin. God, forgive me. Thank you for your forgiveness. It's as simple as that. But we need to realize that we need to, um, to obey Mom and Dad. Now, we need to say that God ultimately dealt with sin by Jesus' death on the cross and paid the penalty for all of your sin. And that's why we put our faith in Jesus as our only way to heaven. Boys and girls, if you have already put your faith in Christ as your way to heaven, you know you're going to heaven if you die tonight because Jesus died for you, then your penalty is paid. If you've never uh, realized that, you've never come to your faith in Jesus Christ and you don't know for sure if you'd go to heaven if you died, then this is a wonderful opportunity because disobeying parents is just one illustration of sin in our life. And we're all sinners, every single one of us. And every single person, except Jesus who is perfect, needs to have that penalty paid. That's why Jesus died on the cross and paid the penalty for our sin, and that's why you need to put your trust in him. 
And you can know that you're going to heaven based on God's promises in his word if you put your trust in what Jesus did for you on the cross and say, I want to go to heaven only because Jesus died for me. Then the penalty is paid. Now what we're talking about is on a daily, daily basis, when we sin, one of the ways is disobeying mom and dad. That disobeys God, that's sin. Then we confess our sin. If we're already a believer, we already put our faith in Christ, the penalty is already paid, we're on our way to heaven, we have eternal life. Now we want to be in fellowship with God. We don't want any sin to stand in our way. You know, when we disobey mom and dad, we feel kind of guilty. Mom and dad sometimes feel disappointed. They don't really approve of what we did. And there's kind of this, well, this bad feeling between us. And we need to go straighten that out. And so, boys and girls, we need to go to mom and dad and say, I'm sorry. I disobeyed you. I shouldn't have. I did. Maybe there's discipline involved if, you, if mom and dad have set that and agreed to that, what the consequences are. But, you know, they forgive us. And then, again, there's nothing in, in, in between us, all right? And so we, we're happy to be together. Our fellowship is, is uh, the way we want it again. We have good feelings between us. It's like that with God as well. We want to maintain our fellowship with God. And so we confess our sin to him as well. Children are commanded to obey parents. How much? Well, the verse we're looking at today says, in all things. Children, obey your parents in all things. This is the measure of how much children ought to obey. Now, a couple things about that. It's easy for us to use the excuse and say, well, I sometimes obey mom and dad. In fact, I usually obey mom and dad, but maybe this one time is okay to disobey them. That's not really what God's word says, does it? Doesn't uh, just look back at one or two instances and says, well, obeyed mom and dad last week. You know, maybe I can get away without obeying them now. No, it says in all things. And, you know, that also includes even when we don't feel like it. Wow. There are some times that mom and dad ask us to do something. I don't know. Clean your room. Take out the trash. I don't know. Whatever that might be. And you don't feel like doing that at all. Or maybe go to bed. It's time for bed. Stop, you know, watching this what pro TV program or uh, what's on the internet or whatever interesting you're doing playing with something it's time for bed you've got to get to bed so you can get up tomorrow and we don't feel like it at all well that's one of the main things we need to learn is that we need to obey mom and dad first of all and God secondly no matter whether we feel like it or not and I think that's one of the reasons that the Bible says obey children obey your parents in all things whether we feel like it or not, uh, some children, as they get a little bit older, they think, you know what, I don't really agree with mom and dad. I don't think they're really right to ask me to do that or whatever. The Bible tells us obey them in all things anyway. We're to obey them. Now, obedience is required even when we don't feel like it, even when we might not agree with mom and dad. Children should be obedient in attitude as well. In attitude as well as word and action. Now, I've used this illustration other times, but you know, there's times when boys and girls say, all oh, right, if I have to, I'm going to go do this. I remember. I was a boy. I said that. <laughs> but my attitude wasn't very good, was it, in doing that? And, uh, you know, the illustration where mom says, okay, you've got to have a time out and sit in the corner here. And no, you can't take a book with you. No, you can't take any toys. You just need to think about, you know, what you've done here, getting in a fight with your sister or whatever the case might be. You need to sit in that corner. Of course, the little boy doesn't want to do that. And uh, mom, you know, makes him sit in the corner. And so the little boy says, well, okay, on the outside I'm sitting down, but on the inside I'm standing up. That, you know, the Bible wants boys and girls to obey mom and dad, not just because they have to. It involves our attitude, too, in saying, okay, even though I don't feel like it, even though I would make a decision about what to do right now differently than mom and dad, I want to obey them. Because God tells me to do that. 
And so I want to do that. I'm going to have a good attitude about it. Mom wants me to clean my room or clean the garage or, or you know, whatever the case might be. Or Dad tells me to do this. I'm going to have a good attitude about it. Even though it's not my choice, I'm just going to go do it and have a good attitude. That's part of obeying. Part of obedience is attitude. Jesus often pointed at the leaders, the spiritual leaders of his day, the scribes and Pharisees. And he would say, well, you're obeying, you know, the law outwardly, but inwardly, your attitude is wrong, and that's sin. So, obeying parents in all things includes our attitude. We need to have a good attitude. Now, you say, well, now, why would God have set up the home this way? Well, first of all, he needs order in the home, and so there's, you know, an order, husband, Role, leading role, wife, and then children obeying mom and dad so that things flow smoothly, so that there's order, so that there's, uh, um, you know, people know what they're supposed to do and so on. Secondly, it teaches us to be submissive to authorities. That is a lesson we're going to have to learn all of our life. You might say, I can't wait until I get big enough and I leave home and I don't have to obey mom and dad anymore. I don't have to obey anybody. That will never be the case. We always have authorities above us we need to obey. You know, there's always police and teachers in school and, and uh, if you go work at a job, there's uh, people there above you. There's nowhere in life really that you never have to submit to someone's authority. Ultimately, of course, we are all under God's authority. And so learning to obey mom and dad is a very, very important lesson. If we don't learn to obey them, we're going to struggle our whole life to obey other authorities in our life. Unfortunately, you know, we've got problems in school with some students who never learn to obey mom and dad at home, and now they don't know how and don't want to, and don't think they need to, obey a teacher in school either, or whatever the case might be. Warren Wiersbe wrote about this verse and said, the child who does not learn to obey his parents is not likely to grow up obeying any authority. He will defy his teachers, he will defy the police, his employers, and anyone else who tries to exercise authority over him. The breakdown in authority in our society reflects the breakdown of authority in the home. And so this is a very important lesson. It's not only to protect you. God did not only give you a mom and dad to protect you from danger, to teach you what not to do. You know, you don't want to stick your hand in the fire to learn that, uh, oh, that's dangerous. That fire is hot, and it really does a lot of damage, and it takes weeks and a lot of pain to heal. You don't really want to learn that way. You'd rather have a mom and dad warn you and say, don't do that because it's very dangerous, and you'll be very sorry because it's going to damage you, and you're going to have a lot of pain and a lot of long-time recuperation. It's easier to learn that way, to listen to them. God gave you parents to help you. And God gave you parents to teach you how to obey authority because you're going to need that the whole rest of your life. And that's important. Now, let's talk for a moment. The word here is technon, usually referring to little children. Um, we talk about children maybe coming of age, 18 or whatever, when they kind of leave home and go out on their own. Some go out to uh, college, some go to uh, work, so on. We're primarily talking about children obeying their parents, um, you know, in that age when they're in that home and under the parents, um, under their care. Now, obviously, as ch children grow older, we give them more and more responsibility over their own life. They make more and more of their own choices and decisions. What about grown children? What about grown children? The Bible talks about honoring our father and mother, and we can do things as grown children to honor them, spending time with them and showing we love them and, and listening to their advice and those kinds of things. But the Bible also makes clear in Genesis 2, 24 and 20, 25 that uh, as an older adult goes out and gets married and starts their own life and their own family, 
then they begin to make their choices together as husband and wife. They become one new unit. They leave father and mother. And so that, that, that uh, relationship changes some. Now, there are some singles, of course, who don't go out and get married, and some of them are living at, in mom and dad's home as well for uh, economic help and so on. Um, I want to just challenge you that's there, if there are rules of the household and you're part of that household, there are responsibilities, things you need to be doing to help the household run, uh, things that you know you need to communicate very, very well, even though you're an adult child, with mom and dad and say, okay, so I'm living here, so what do I need to do to help this household? What are my responsibilities? What are the expectations? Make sure that that's very, very clear and that you're honoring your parents in that setting as well. But this verse is using the word technon, talking about children mostly that are beneath that age of 18, or they're not independent. They are dependent in some way on their, on their mom and dad. So the next thing we want to simply say is that just like any um, submission to any authority, uh, obviously parents should not ask their children to do something that is against God's word, that breaks his law. That's true whether it's employers asking work people, workers to do something unethical, whether it's a husband asking his wife to do something immoral, or parents and children. And if that's the case, I think children can uh, go to mom and dad and communicate and say, you know, I think what you're asking me to do, I understand disobeys God's word, and, and talk about that, and very in an honorly way uh, talk about that. Now, children's obedience, it says, pleases God. Why do we obey God? What's the motivation for obeying parents, mom and dad? It's to please God, to obey uh, God. It's his command that he's given. In the Old Testament, disobedience on the part of children was considered to be disobeying God. In fact, if a child rebelled against his parents and said, I don't want anything to do with their authority, I'm going to do my own thing, it was considered to be rebellion against God. And in the Old Testament law, where things were a lot more serious, um, there was a very, very serious consequence. Exodus 20, verse 12, of course, is the fifth commandment of the Ten Commandments. It says, Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. God is actually saying, if you disobey mom and dad, your days on this earth will be shortened because you're disobeying God. God can discipline. He's the best father there is. And, you know, part of that discipline, if you and I don't listen and want to rebel and do things your own way, can be a shorter than should have been physical life. Certainly not a smooth life. Proverbs is a book that's filled with wisdom, talking a lot about children who do not follow wisdom and don't obey their parents, and their life is less smooth, more troublesome, and shorter on the general rule. Then, of course, there's some more warnings. A few verses chapter later, Exodus 21, 17, he who curses his father or his mother shall be put to death. So this was like oh, disobeying God. It was like rebelling against God. Again, that's repeated in Leviticus. For everyone who curses his father or mother shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or mother. His blood shall be upon him. Disobeying parents and rebelling against them was considered to be rebelling against God. And so again, we obey because God commanded us to do that. Obedience on the part of children is God's design for order of the home. Obedience makes God happy. Now, boys and girls, there's a difference between making God happy and his loving you. God loves you, period. He loved you so much he sent Jesus to die on the cross for you, for your sins in your place. God will never love you more or less. No matter what you do, all the good, you can be the best boy or girl, you've been on the best day of your life, that won't make God love you more. You, if you disobey mom and dad and you blow it, that doesn't make God love you less. He loves you the same no matter what. That's unconditional love. But you and I can make God happy he can approve of what we do or disapprove of what we do. And so our goal should be not to make God love us more, can't do that, but to make him happy. 
Is God happy with my actions and my attitude and how I relate to mom and dad and how I relate to brothers and sisters? And is God, does God, is God happy with me right now watching what I do and knowing what I think and knowing what I say? That's how we can please God. Obeying our parents, the Bible says, pleases God. And we want to please him. The context here, obedience teaches that submission will be rewarded by Jesus someday. Now let's skip down a couple of verses, okay? We'll come to this later as we uh, continue Sunday to Sunday going through this passage. But skip down with me to verse 24. Uh, in between verses 22 and 23, you're going to talk about working for, uh, for an employer or whatever. And then verse 24, why do we submit in all these ways? Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Children, if you obey mom and dad, that's pleasing to God. And in this context, God says he will reward that. You will be evaluated someday. And part of what you'll be evaluated on is how you related to mom and dad. Did you do it in a pleasing, a, a way that was pleasing to God? Now, you know, some boys and girls say, wow, the Bible talks about rewards, and we talk about that in church. I, I, I'm too young. I can't really, uh, you know, do things for, for God that I want to do someday. Might have good intentions, you know. I can't be a missionary uh, or in another country right now. Uh, you can be a witness where you are. Um, I can't do some of the things that, that, we're, that we're talking about. But you know what? This is what you can do now. None of us know <clears throat> when evaluation day is for us. None of us know how long our life is. We have to be living every day. We could meet Jesus. The rapture could happen. We could meet him tonight yet. That would be great. What would Jesus say to little boys and girls on evaluation day? Well, he wouldn't talk about whether they went to a mission field or not. They weren't old enough to even have that opportunity. But he would evaluate them on how they obeyed mom and dad, how they fulfilled the responsibilities the Bible gives them. And so that's one of the reasons it's important to, to, to please God by obeying mom and dad. Jesus is going to evaluate that. And he promises he will reward it. So it's very important to take this verse to heart and to please God. Wow. Another possible uh, translation would be to be well-pleasing in his sight. Uh, that would be in this context. So we see that the first thing in this passage is to boys and girls, God wants in the family parents to be the authority and boys and girls to obey them. How much? In a few things? No, in all things. Why is that important? Because God commanded it and he said it pleases God. And there's reward for it. That's what God, that's the major responsibility God has given you, boys and girls, right now, and young people, is to obey mom and dad. That should be a primary focus in your life. All right? No mom and dad aren't perfect. We acknowledge that. God knows that. But he's put them as, as an authority in your life. And uh, we need to obey them and, and also in attitude, not in just action. That pleases God. So I want to encourage you to think about this. This is a good verse to memorize, isn't it? Because there's sometimes we don't feel like obeying mom and dad. And we need to remind ourselves that uh, that's one of the commandments, one of the Ten Commandments. And it's repeated in Ephesians, it's repeated here in Colossians. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. And do it for God. Now, of course, the second thing, the next verse, there's a responsibility to parents as well. And it says, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Parents are not to discourage their children by provoking them or Irritating them would be another word that that could be used to translate. Parents are warned not to provoke their children. The word fathers here isn't just only to fathers, okay? Uh, there are times in certain contexts where the word for father includes both parents. And I think it does here as well. 
One of those illustrations would be Hebrews 11:23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents, the translators translate, although it is the word for father. Because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. Now we know from the Old Testament that uh, mom was very, very involved with sister Miriam in hiding Moses. And so it's right to translate this parents. And there are other places as well. Uh, in Proverbs 1, 8, we see the parallelism of mom and dad being the parental authority together. My son, hear the instruction of your father. Do not forsake the law of your mother. Proverbs is poetry. And there are parallel lines many, many times. And so father and mother, uh, just a different way of saying the same thing, but uh, children are to obey both father and mother. Um, 620 as well. My son, keep your father's command. Do not forsake the law of your mother. Father and mother are both parents, are both to be obeyed. Parents are to nurture their children and encourage them to be godly individuals. Now, again, in the parallel passage to Colossians we're looking at today, in Ephesians 6, 4, and you fathers, or we could say fathers and mothers, you parents, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Ephesians adds the positive to it as well. Bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. The Old Testament, Deuteronomy, commanded them to train the children. Bring them up in the Lord and to trust Him and to obey Him. Do not provoke your children to wrath, to anger. Uh, Colossians says provoking them discourages them, uh, makes them very frustrated. Warren Wiersbe writing about this verse says, For the most part, children do not create problems in the home. All the children said amen. <laughs> For the most part, children do not create problems. They reveal them. Parents who cannot discipline themselves cannot discipline their children. If a father and mother are not under authority themselves, they cannot exercise authority over others. It is only as parents submit to each other and to the Lord that they can exercise properly balanced spiritual and physical authority over their children. So, Warren Wiersbe is saying, wisely, when there's major discipline problems in a home, it's not just the children. It's often parents as well who are faulty. Either they are not a good model of disciplining themselves or being under any kind of authority themselves. Um, you know, we've mentioned when we talk about mom being uh, one of the major models of uh, submitting to her husband. If that model's not in the home, then children are learning a very, very bad pattern about uh, what submission is and what it isn't, and so on. So parents, we, uh, coupled with ob children obeying parents, is a command to parents to be good parents as well. Parents provoke their children when they exasperate them and make them bitter and angry. Again, this verse in Ephesians, provoking your children to wrath. You don't want your children to be bitter, to be angry at you as parents because you have provoked them, you have so discouraged them. The word exasperate involves the irritation, the prov provocation that these verses are talking about. Now, why is that important? Because parents are warned that they will discourage their children by provoking them. The word discourage means to be disheartened broken in spirit, to lose heart. Now, there are some parents that have strong-willed children, and they believe they need to break the spirit of that child. No, that's not biblical. You need to channel it. You need to, um, you know, help them learn how to discipline themselves and obey authority, but you don't want to break their spirit. You don't want to have them give up. You don't want them to have to, to lose heart and to say, I can never ever do this right. I can never please mom and dad, whatever. That is against God's word. So the important question here is not what does that mean? We know what that means. It's how do we apply that? What are ways in which parents would provoke children and so discourage them or provoke them to wrath that they would give up, 
they are they're, they're broken hearted their, their spirit is broken uh, they're so angry and bitter that uh, they give up on trying to obey mom and dad and follow the right way well let me give you some suggestions and I'm sure you can maybe add some more one of the ways that irritates children and discourages them greatly is constant criticism constant criticizing your children everything they do could be corrected everything they do could be done better uh, discourages them children needs lots need lots of praise for doing well yes we need to correct them uh, you know this pendulum swings from one extreme to the other doesn't it and uh, today in our school system we're afraid to correct anybody no the Bible tells us to correct children and um, help them do better but we need to give lots and lots of praise or else they're going to be discouraged and give up. Perfectionistic expectations on the part of parents. Now, maybe some of you feel like you had parents like that. Maybe you know parents like that who are so perfectionistic that, um, you know, the child brings home from school an A and mom and dad are not satisfied because it is not an A+. Plus child does a very good job, their best at doing this chore, doing obeying, doing what mom and dad tell them. And mom and dad can always find something wrong with it. It's not perfect. You know, that is going to frustrate a child. That would frustrate you if you were at work doing that, right? Put yourself in that place. And so a perfectionistic expectation on the part of parents is going to irritate, is going to exasperate, is going to provoke that child and they are sooner or later are going to give up they're going to become bitter we need to compliment and encourage children to do their very best yes but if they do their best that is the best they can do and we need to compliment them now all of us say oh no I don't expect them to be perfect but we come across with greater expectations than we think I know sometimes my children have uh, told me that I'm too critical. I talk too much about things they can correct. What is my excuse back? Well, I don't need to talk about all the good things you did. I need to correct the, bad, the things that need improvement. But that's, that's inadequate on my part as a parent. I need to compliment them much, much more. You know, there's a rule of thumb. Some people say for every criticism you give, you ought to give nine compliments. Well, the point is that you and I are more critical than we think we are. So ask your children, how critical am I? Am I too critical? Do I compliment you and tell you when you do a good job? And listen for feedback and um, see how their spirit is being affected by that and then change, all right? We are not, we need to grow, we need to help. Another thing that affects children negatively is performance based love. Now here again, parents are sometimes not aware of this. Maybe you grew up in a home where you felt performance based love. I love you if you do well. I love you if you get A's in school. I love you if you don't disobey me or if you don't fail or whatever. I love you if you do uh, very, very well and excel in sports or uh, your job or whatever. I love you if. No, that's conditional love. That is not the way God loves us. That's not the way God loves boys and girls. That's not the way parents are to love their children. Our love is not based on performance. We love them, period, no matter how well they do. And if they get the idea that mom and dad don't really love me, they don't really uh, relate well to me, uh, unless I do, uh, you know, what they want me to do, a perfect job, then that's performance-based love. And that is a very uh, detrimental thing in their life. And they will give up because they cannot always perform up to your standards or someone else's standards. If they learn that in the home from you as parents, they believe they will have to function on that all the way through their life. Performance-based love. Again, it's, we need to really think about that and check. Do we love them when they don't do so well, when they disobey, when they could have done better? Do we love them the same? Yes, we can challenge them to do better, but it better not involve how we love them. 
Loving discipline will not provoke them, but angry and unfair discipline will. Wow, how often are we tempted to discipline children in anger? Discipline ought not to be done in anger. There are some times that mom and dad need to say, son or daughter, we are going to deal with this disobedience in 20 minutes from now because I can't deal with it right now. And we need to go cool off, and we need to pray, and we need to change our attitude and come so that we can be as a mature adult and talk about the facts, not the emotions, not how angry or disappointed it makes us or whatever. That's not the issue. It's here's what you did to disobey, and here's the consequence. And so sometimes we need to check ourselves and do that. Unfair discipline. Wow. Not all of our discipline is, not all of our assumptions are correct. Sometimes we discipline our children and they really weren't at fault. Sometimes that's because we don't listen to them. We jump to conclusions and discipline them and we don't give them a chance to explain why this situation happened like this may not have been all of their fault. Or sometimes we accuse them of something that they really did not do. I remember when Christy was young, um, I accused her of taking, a, I think, a watch and putting it in a drawer or something so I couldn't find it. I don't remember the exact details. And, um, you know, she's the only other person in the house. My wife didn't do it, so um, she had to do it. Well, later on, I found out or remembered or figured out why that watch was in that strange place, and I had to go back to Christy, and although I didn't discipline her for it, I had accused her of it. And I said, Christy, and she was, you know, three or four toddler, I said, I'm sorry. Dad is sorry. I accused you of maybe taking this watch and, and losing it or hiding it in this drawer. And now I realize how it got there. And that I was wrong. Forgive me. We all, not all of our discipline is fair. And so we need to be wise. We need to listen. We need to apologize when we're wrong. We are sinners. We do make wrong assumptions and so on. And so if we don't do that, if we are unfair in that, then they're going to give up. They're going to disheart be disheartened because there's nothing they can do to obey when it wasn't their problem. Some of these things, by the way, I have for the past two weeks asked my two daughters, both, one by Skype and one by Word, um, what should we be talking about? What does we as parents do that provoked you wrongly? So, um, so these are, are real. We experienced them. Inconsistency in requirements. Mom and dad, sometimes when they're good mood, they're pretty lenient and we can do this, no problem. And then sometimes when they're in a bad mood, we can do the very same thing and they come down really hard on us. How do children know what to obey? Do they have to sense our mood and take our temperature and, you know, whatever else to know what, which, way to, which way to go? What, what's the rule? How's the rule today? No, that's inconsistency. That does not, that, that frustrates a child. Or maybe mom and dad are different. Maybe mom says, you know what? You can do this. That's fine. And dad says, why did you do that? Absolutely not. You can't do that. Mom and dad, get it together. Be unified in what you determine you want your children to do and follow. Um, don't get your children in the middle uh, and try to, you know, and they can, of course, play that against mom and dad as well, going from one to the other, trying to figure out uh, what they can really do and who will let them and who won't. Don't swing from permissiveness to rigidity based on your moods. Don't say no without listening to your child's request and evaluating it, especially as teenagers come and say, well, mom, you know, there's this meeting. My friends have asked me to be a part of this. Can I do that? And sometimes we just, no, absolutely not, without even listening to the situation or what's happening, uh, that's not fair. That's going to frustrate our children. That's going to make them uh, angry and bitter. Parents who change their minds create problems for their children. My daughters remember some time when I told them they could go to some party and then later said, no, they can't. And uh, they had to come explain and uh, um, you know why you said yes in the first place. Why are you saying no now? And we had to get that straightened out and said, okay, they can go. Uh, inconsistency, though, causes them problems. 
Um, parents need to establish and clearly communicate good boundaries and then enforce them consistently. This is the boundary. This is the way we want you to act. This is what we allow to do, and we need to, con we need to be consistent. And you know, sometimes, by the way, I highly recommend the book Boundaries and Parenting, uh, we don't want to be consistent. We sometimes say, make a rule and say, well, now, if you don't do your homework or whatever, you can't go to extracurricular activities. You can't do the fun things before your work is done. And then along comes the best friend's birthday party, and we as parents feel bad. We say, I don't want them to miss their best friend's birthday party, and so we bend that boundary. We bend that rule and say, well, you can go anyway. That's inconsistent. That um, causes them frustration. Even though they want to go, they do want to know what the rules are clearly. We need to be consistent. Parents need to be unified in their instruction requirements. Parents who use their children as weapons for fighting against each other. Oh, that's terrible. There the child is in the middle, and dad is trying to have his authority and show his authority by disagreeing with mom and making the child try to obey him, not mom. That's using the child in the middle. That's very frustrating. Consistency must be balanced with flexibility for differing situations. Yes, we have boundaries, we have expectations, but some things are different. This situation is unique, and so we need to be flexible and communicate well to our children. Well, those are some of the ways. Parents refusing to listen to and understand their children. You know, children's problems maybe seem small to you as a parent. You know, what's the big deal? I mean, I have to go earn a living every day and deal with the boss or whatever. Well, they have to deal with us. And for them, their problems are big in their eyes. And so we need to listen, and we need to take time, and we need to understand their emotions and their struggles, and uh, that will help them greatly. A listening ear and a loving heart will go a long way to show them love. One daughter said to her father, You took time to have me, but you won't take time to listen to me. And that's an indictment on parents. Parents frustrate children when they say, do as I say, not as I do. When we are not the model of what we say, we do something different, but we expect them to do it a certain way, even though we don't do it. We're not disciplined or whatever. So that also frustrates children. Older children who have no input into family decisions. Uh, it involves them. It's a family thing, a family outing or whatever, but, you know, dad just plans it alone or mom, and they have no input at all as they grow older and need, the, need to make decisions and want to be a part of the family. Uh, that'll become frustrating to them. Parents who enforce rules to increase their own power without explanations of why the rules are important. Again, a teenager says, well, why? Why do you see this this way? Why do you want me to act a certain way or not be a part of this or whatever? Just because I said so. No, we need to teach older children, help them to understand why. This is dad's reasoning. This is mom's reasoning. Um, you know, there might be good and bad things about this, but I'm trying to protect you from this or whatever. We need to talk, communicate. We want to teach them how to make decisions. Howard Hendricks used to tell us in the seminary classroom, parents, you have 18 years, roughly, you have 18 years to prepare your children to make the most important decisions of their life. And you need to see it that way. We need to train them how to think, how to make decisions. They need to begin to make decisions and even experience the consequences if they make a wrong decision, but they need to learn how to do that. And we need to communicate with them and talk with them Children are frustrated when parents compare one child with another. Why can't you be like your brother? Why can't you be like your sister? Why can't you accomplish and do as well in school as your brother? That sets up an unnecessary competition in the home. People are different. Children are different. They have different personalities. They have different strengths. And we need to celebrate those strengths, and we need to help them improve where they need to improve. We need to help them do their best, and let's not uh, compare one with another. Parents who do not extend common courtesies to their children frustrate them. Um, like continuing, oh, my girls claim that um, 
I would talk to them and then they would, we'd kind of finish and be done and they would leave to go downstairs to their bedroom and then as they're going down the stairs, I bring up another topic <laughs> and want to call them back. And that that was frustrating to them. All kinds of little common courtesies we need to be careful about that we would um, do to anyone else. Growing children need the experience of making some of their decisions and leaving and learning what the consequences are. We talked about that. Growing children need to learn to discipline their own time and experience their own consequences. Um, there comes a time as they grow up where we probably ought not to say, I want you to do this now, this second. They need to learn to discipline their own time. And so we say, you know, by noon or by tonight, I want you to have accomplished this, clean your room or whatever. And um, let them organize their time and make sure that's a priority so they get that done. We need to uh, sort of let them learn. There are exceptions when tough love is needed, for instance. Certainly there's common courtesy with privacy and so on, but you know if a parent uh, wonders about their child, what they're into, uh, um, tough love would say I need to go search the room and see if there's things there that shouldn't be or they're doing things they shouldn't be or whatever uh, because we love them. Uh, but we do need to uh, explain to them and give them common courtesy. One last one, parents who do not spend time with their children. Now you've seen the studies, there are times that they say fathers spend an average of 37 seconds with their child each day. Wow, that's not adequate for parenting and for training them in godly uh, ways that the Bible talks about. We need to be willing to spend time with them. You know, there's a well-known Bible scholar, if I said his name, you would recognize it. Written commentaries, was a well-known pastor. But when he died, his three sons refused to even attend his funeral. They were so angry and bitter at him for never spending time with them. That is not godly. That is not being a parent. That is not being a model. And so our priorities, God has given us children as an important gift and a responsibility, and we need to spend the necessary time with them. Listen carefully, share their feelings and frustrations, pray with them, encourage them. Warren Wiersbe says, home ought to be the happiest and best place in all the world. Is your home the happiest and best place? Or do the children long to get out of there? Now these are great applications that Paul writing gives us and we need to ask the hard questions and be honest with ourselves of where we need to grow and improve, don't we? We've seen this morning mature Christian behavior should also affect the parent-child relationships in the home. Children are to obey their parents and parents are not to discourage their children by provoking them. In conclusion, Warren Wiersbe writes, if a home is truly Christian, it is a place of encouragement. In such a home, the child finds refuge from battles. Notice, there ought not to be battles in the home. It's a refuge from battles. And yet strength to fight the battles and carry the burdens of growing maturity. He finds a loving heart, a watching eye, a listening ear, and a helping hand. He does not want any other place. Home meets his needs. In this kind of a home, it is natural for the child to trust Christ and want to live for him. Now, as we close this morning, I want to challenge you. Children, ask your mom and dad, how am I doing in obeying you as parents? What are some ways that I need to improve? Maybe attitudes I need to change, whatever. Then seek to obey them in both action and attitude so that you will please God and he will reward you. Parents, wow, ask your children what things you might do or say which provoke them, which irritate them, which exasperate them, and which discourage them. And listen. Don't be defensive. Don't cut them off. Listen. And then seek to change your parenting habits in order to love and encourage your children. Father, thank you that Jesus Christ and his supernatural power in our life affects all of the practical areas of our life. And even these important areas of home relationships. Father, thank you for the boys and girls here this morning and young people. And we pray that they would take seriously your command to them to obey mom and dad, the authorities that you've put in, uh, in their home and their lives. 
in all things in order to please you and that you will reward them for it and just uh, help them as boys and girls to uh, be obedient and to learn the important habit of being obedient to authority. And then as parents, Father, I pray you would help us to have a listening ear and honestly uh, listen to our children and um, rightly assess whether we are exasperating them, irritating them, discouraging them, making them bitter. And Father, I pray that you would help us to be the parents you want us to be with unconditional love, with encouragement, with um, channeling them to be godly and uh, help us to change by your Holy Spirit's power in order to be the mature Christian you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.